Tomorrow is Canada Day, and I want to acknowledge that there are many things to celebrate about living in this country. The fact that we enjoy unparalleled freedoms, uh, it's a place where respect and caring are at the very heart of who we are. We've seen in this past year Canadians at their best, caring for each other, supporting each other during a long, painful pandemic. But it is also important for us to focus on the challenges we've seen to our celebrated Canadian values, both in our past and in more recent times. The sad history of the residential schools has been brought to searing points of tragedy, new searing points of tragedy, by the recent discoveries of unmarked and mass graves. This has once again brought us face to face with a shameful chapter in our history which continues to impact Indigenous communities, including the survivors and many others who continue to be traumatized by these events. It should cause us all to reflect on Canada Day how we can bring our relationship with Indigenous peoples into line with how we see our country and how we see ourselves, and our commitment to respect and equality starting with Indigenous people. So I encourage people to take time on Canada Day to reflect on what each of us can and must do to live up to Canadian values and make sure this country is everything we want it to be and more. To help our city to reflect on reconciliation, the Toronto sign will join the CN Tower in lighting up in orange tomorrow in solidarity with Indigenous communities across Canada. The city will also be encouraging people to learn more about Canada's history and relationship with Indigenous communities. More than 3.4 million vaccine doses have now been administered in our city. We're making great progress, and that progress will continue through the holiday uh, and the long weekend, thanks to Team Toronto and everyone who will continue to be working through that period to get others vaccinated. Thank you as well to everyone who isn't waiting and who will get their shot over the holiday period. That's the right thing to do, to get vaccinated as soon as possible and then get your second shot as soon as you're able to do so. Yesterday, the city opened up more than 375,000 vaccination appointments, new vaccination appointments, over the next three weeks. More than 101,000 people signed up on day one yesterday, and we expect that will continue to be the case as more and more people get appointments booked. Our excellent progress on vaccination is helping drive down COVID-19 case numbers so that we can progress with the reopening of our city and of our province. Step two started today, and I want to again encourage people to support their favorite hair salon or barbershop or nail salon or tattoo parlor. This pandemic and the health measures have been incredibly tough, especially for these hard-working businesses offering personal services, so please book your appointments and please tip generously when you're there uh, taking advantage of these now available services. The Active TO weekend road closures continue to be a popular and successful program that has supported Toronto's ongoing pandemic response efforts. City staff have been exploring opportunities to expand the program to different parts of the city as much as possible while working to keep delivering popular routes as much as possible. After reviewing the spring data and listening to the community feedback, we are releasing an Active TO schedule today for the month of July. This will help people and families make plans to use active TO weekend closures and to try the different and exciting options that are being planned. City transportation professionals have analyzed the data from the spring closures, including pedestrian and cycling counts, and have reviewed local traffic impacts, including the impacts on local communities. Staff have also listened to the residents from those local communities and taken into account planned summer construction. The July schedule includes flexibility and variety and ensures that weekend closures are available to more people in more places across the city. A minimum of four active TO locations are expected to be available each weekend during the month of July. The schedule includes brand new locations including all roads within Exhibition Place on July 10th and 11th, a portion of Black Creek Drive on July 17th, and the introduction of the Meadowway in Scarborough as an active TO route on every weekend in July. The busy Lakeshore Boulevard West route will be back on this coming weekend, July 3rd and 4th, and on the July 31st long weekend later in the month. Staff plan to deliver a version of this popular active TO corridor every weekend during July, except when the Gardner Expressway is closed for its scheduled maintenance, at which time we will introduce the new active TO location at Exhibition Place. 
A slightly adapted Lakeshore West route will be available between Jamison Avenue and Stadium Road on the other two July weekends, July 17th and 18th, and again on July 24th and 25th. This trial approach will help balance the needs of local communities, better manage known traffic impacts that result from the closure, and take into account the effects from local construction projects, serious large-scale construction projects such as the nearby King, Queen, Queensway, Roncesvalles construction, and it, it helps to reduce the impact on congestion and on transit service. Staff have committed to providing a full vehicle closure of Lower Bayview Avenue as many times as possible in July and the Lakeshore Boulevard East Route each weekend in July. The data gathered from this past spring shows that city staff have delivered active TO weekends in a responsible way. It also reinforces that we must carefully listen to and respond to the impacts felt by the local communities that are affected by this when those closures are in place. Lakeshore West data shows us that active TO continues to be tremendously popular. When it is in place, the Lakeshore West route, weekend counts have shown as many as 34,000 cyclists and 5,000 pedestrians on select weekends. The data also tells us, however, the other side of the story. When the Lakeshore West closure is in place, there are significant impacts to travel time, sometimes as much as double or triple, on the Gardner Expressway and the Queensway. And this, in turn, causes traffic to sometimes enter into the local community and has an impact on them and on their uh, quality of life uh, and the people who live there. What the data does not show is the feedback that we have received from the people who live around the Lakeshore West route. And this is something that goes back to last year but has continued this year. I take this feedback seriously as I must. It is my job to represent all of the people of the City of Toronto, those who wish to cycle and, and skateboard and stroller and walk uh, on the active TO routes, but also those who live in the areas around those routes. And it is uh, something that we must take into account in deciding when and where those active TO routes will be made available. The space created along Lakeshore East and Bayview Avenue has also seen thousands of people enjoying these routes for cycling, for walking and running, and there's been minimal impact to the surrounding areas. We've observed cycling counts as high as 12,700 people and more than 15,000 pedestrians along Lakeshore East. On Bayview Avenue, upwards of 5,600 cyclists and 1,400 pedestrians have been counted when the full vehicle closure is in place. Uh, you can see, because I've examined myself the traffic information, uh, the impact is much less on that, which in turn includes uh, transit vehicles and also will then lessen the impact on surrounding neighbourhoods, which again is an important consideration for us to look at in all of this. Active TO is a success. You've heard me say before that I would like to find ways to make this program a permanent feature of our city in the summertime, uh, pandemic uh, time or not. It's a great, safe way to go out and be able to get exercise and enjoy the city. It has worked because we're going about it in a data-driven and responsible and considerate way, and we will continue to do so. I'm excited to announce that the free drop-in programs, Parks Play TO and Summer in the Six, will be back this summer to help Toronto kids get out and be active in our parks and outdoor spaces across the city. Starting Monday, July 5th, Parks Play TO will offer eight weeks of free drop-in and activity-based recreational programming for kids 12 and under from Monday to Friday at 74 different locations across the city. Summer in the Six also begins on Monday. It is also a free program for Toronto young people aged 13 to 24, offering opportunities to drop in, meet up with other young people and participate in themed activities. The details of these programs can be found at toronto.ca. These drop-in programs are in addition to the Summer Camp TO programs, which also start on Monday. We're ready to welcome 4,135 campers to our summer day camps on Monday. These have all been put together in a way that is safe uh, and in, in uh, concurrence with public health guidelines. With all these recreation programs starting up, it is summer in Toronto again, and I want to thank all of the city staff who are working to make sure that our young people have a fun, happy and safe summer. They've had to make uh, changes to these programs, modifications to make sure they're safe and healthy. They've done so often in fairly short order, and I want to thank them for all of our efforts. It is a further indication of our collective effort in the fight against COVID-19, uh, and it, it allows us to move ahead with all of these programs uh, in changed circumstances. This progr uh, progress also leads to changes internally in how the city is responding to COVID-19. 
City Manager Chris Murray has asked Chief Pegg to continue uh, to serve as our COVID-19 incident commander and to lead the transition from COVID-19 response and immunization task force operations through to the completion of the demobilization and recovery phase of those operations. While Chief Pegg and his team will continue to monitor the COVID situation here and around the world, we've also asked him to work to make sure that the shift of city operations back to more normal uh, pre-pandemic levels are done in a proper and orderly way, because it's a big undertaking to resume city operations in many different respects back to uh, as normal a situation as we can possibly achieve. I want to acknowledge the work that every member of the Toronto Public Service has done to respond to COVID-19 and to make sure we're doing everything we can to save lives, get people through this pandemic and continue to deliver city services because they've done a wonderful job in that regard. And I just want you to know that it is a measure of the confidence we have in Chief Pegg and the wonderful performance he's uh, put forward uh, with respect to emergency operations and now the vaccine response uh, that uh, we have asked him uh, to help us with the transition back uh, to a more in a more normal circumstance. We want to take advantage of the same talent and dedication we've seen uh, in those uh, phases uh, that continue uh, for uh, the time to come yet. And on that note, I will ask him to provide his update on our vaccination efforts for today. Chief. Thank you, Mayor Tory, and uh, good morning. At 8 o'clock yesterday morning, we opened 375,000 COVID-19 vaccine appointments across our network of nine city-operated clinics. On the weeks of July 5th, July 12th, and July 19th, our clinics are able to administer 125,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine each week. Beginning July 5th, all nine city-operated clinics will be operating as mRNA vaccine clinics, meaning that we will be interchangeably administering both brands of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, including Pfizer and Moderna, on a daily basis. The brand of vaccine that is administered at any given point in time will be determined solely on the basis of vaccine availability and is not able to be selected in advance nor when you arrive for your appointment at the clinic. The limited supply of Pfizer mRNA vaccine is largely being reserved for youth between the ages of 12 and 17 years of age. As Dr. Davila has often explained, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has indicated that anyone who received a first dose of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine can safely and confidently receive a second dose of either the Pfizer or Moderna mRNA vaccine and vice versa, resulting in them being fully immunized against COVID-19. Unfortunately, over the past number of days, our clinic staff have once again been subjected to inappropriate behavior by a number of clients who arrive for their confirmed appointments and attempt to demand a specific brand of vaccine. This behavior has included aggressive and threatening behavior, verbal attacks, and displays of anger towards our clinic staff. To be very clear, this type of behavior will not be tolerated in any of our clinics for any reason. Our clinic management teams, along with our clinic security staff, will intervene and will immediately remove anyone who displays any type of inappropriate or aggressive behavior towards clinic staff or other clients. Our clinic staff have no ability to determine nor control the allocation of vaccines that are provided to us by the Government of Canada via the Province of Ontario. Both our city-operated clinic staff and our Team Toronto partner clinic staff are giving their all seven days a week to get Toronto vaccinated as soon as possible. Please respect their roles and treat them with the courtesy they deserve. Since our next batch of appointments went live in the system at eight o'clock yesterday morning, more than 102,000 appointments have been successfully booked via the provincial booking system. For the week of July 5th, our clinics are 40% booked with approximately 70,000 appointments remaining available. For the week of July 12th, our clinics are 27% booked, with approximately 90,000 appointments remaining available. And for the week of July 19th, our clinics are 9% booked, with approximately 113,000 appointments remaining available. I want to remind everyone that these appointments are available to anyone who requires their first dose of vaccine, their second dose of vaccine, and to anyone who wishes to accelerate 
their second dose of vaccine. As we entered step two of the provincial reopening plan this morning, our collective ability to remain ahead of the Delta variant and to keep the provincial reopening plan on track is largely dependent on our ability to get as many people fully vaccinated as possible as quickly as possible. For information on vaccine eligibility and to book your appointment in a city-operated clinic, please visit toronto.ca slash COVID-19. If you prefer to either book or reschedule your appointment by phone, you can do so by calling the Provincial Call Centre at 1-833-943-3900. For additional vaccine opportunities outside the network of city-operated clinics, please visit vaccinento.ca for opportunities that may exist in our Team Toronto partner clinics. For those active on social media, I also encourage you to follow Vaccine Hunters Canada on Twitter for additional information on opportunities to receive COVID-19 vaccine in our city. Please continue to ensure that you cancel your appointment via the provincial booking system or the provincial call centre in the event that you will not be attending your scheduled appointment. With tomorrow being Canada Day, I would like to remind everyone about the hazards and rules associated with using fireworks. Fireworks, including seem seemingly harmless items such as handheld sparklers, involve highly flammable chemical compounds that often burn in excess of 1000 degrees Celsius once ignited. I ask you to think about this fact. Even consumer grade fireworks and sparklers burn at more than 10 times the temperature of boiling water and represent an immense safety risk when misused or handled inappropriately. Over the course of my career as a firefighter, I have personally witnessed both catastrophic property damage and horrific physical injuries caused by misused and mishandled fireworks. In Toronto, fireworks may only be discharged without a permit from your own private property and only on Victoria Day or Canada Day. A permit is needed to discharge fireworks on any other day of the year. Fireworks may never be discharged in a city park, from a city street, from a parking lot, from a balcony, or from other people's private property. Discharging or igniting fireworks in a city park or on a public beach is prohibited at all times and anyone under 18 years of age is not permitted to discharge fireworks. If you plan to discharge fireworks on Canada Day tomorrow, please follow the rules and observe all the manufacturer's safety precautions. In closing, we continue to move closer to the point where COVID-19 is finally behind us and where further reopening is possible. As Mayor Tory explained, our team is hard at work planning for both the eventual demobilization of vaccine clinic and EOC operations, as well as citywide recovery and restart operations. I'm honored to have been asked to continue to lead this team into the next and hopefully final phase of operations in response to COVID-19 in Toronto. I thank both Mayor Tory and City Manager Chris Murray for their continued trust and confidence, both in me and more importantly, in the team of amazing and dedicated professionals that I am privileged to work alongside each day. We will continue to operate and evolve our COVID-19 incident management system in order to ensure that we have robust and nimble plans in place as we move forward. Over the past nearly 18 months, our incident management system has evolved from proactively planning for the first arrival of COVID-19 in Toronto to managing the response to the rapidly changing pandemic, including both PPE management and business continuity planning, to building and launching our immunization task force operations, and now into proactively planning for eventual demobilization and citywide recovery. Thank you to our entire citywide team who have and continue to give their all in response to COVID-19 in Toronto. I also extend a very personal thank you to my small but extremely mighty team of four, whom I work alongside every day on our COVID-19 incident management team. Program Manager Melissa Gennaro, Paramedic Services Commander Michael Wianzik, 
Office of Emergency Management Coordinator Simon Wells, and Fire Services Division Chief Darla Tannehill never stop and simply amaze me every day. I owe them all an immeasurable debt of gratitude and thanks, not only for what they do, but for how they do it. Finally, I would like to extend a very special thank you and congratulations to everyone in our city who is making the effort to get vaccinated and to each and every resident and business owner who continue to absorb so much as we work together to stop the spread of COVID-19 in our city. Our collective success in beating the COVID-19 virus has come as a direct result of your sacrifice and commitment to beating this awful virus once and for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. And Mr. Mayor, we'll uh, now go to questions. Um, reporters on the line, uh, Dr. Davila is available for questions as well. So we'll go first to Mark McAllister from City News. Mark, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, congratulations, Chief Pegg, for continuing in your role. Um, I wouldn't mind asking about your role from this point forward really quickly uh, in terms of demobilization and uh, the schedule that will be set out for doing so. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done to get uh, more people vaccinated, but if you could speak to what happens when from this point forward in terms of getting back to normal, so to speak. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Mark. Uh, the when certainly remains to be determined. The what, uh, the what is a complex operation. So um, people may not automatically assume, I, I can say I'm not even sure that I fully understood until now that demobilizing or starting to scale down and ultimately uh, disassemble and take apart and shut down clinics is actually a more complicated operation than it is to set them up. So our team is now hard at work, uh, obviously in direct and daily uh, collaboration with Toronto Public Health and through Toronto Public Health with the province. So the timing on when any of that will, will commence obviously is entirely uh, as directed by Dr. Davila and that of course will be determined upon vaccine rates and um, infection rates and all of the, all of those things so that's a medical decision. The, the logistics operation involves uh, everything from managing the contracts for some of the facilities uh, making sure that um, the vaccine booking system or the provincial booking system is uh, remains in line and of course consistent with that and making sure that we have all of the necessary plans in place to uh, systematically and smoothly and efficiently uh, begin to scale down when that time comes. There's a, there's a wide range. The city manager has asked, uh, has asked our team to lead and to remain connected, will if you will, with with all of the uh, corporate leadership team, all of the division and agency heads across the city, and really to provide overarching support and assistance to each of them as we move through this process. And we'll simply leverage the same incident management system that we have used throughout to make sure that we can provide that coordination, that overarching coordination, to make sure that we remain connected to the executive leadership teams and to whatever construct. Uh, we put in place, uh, presently it's the immunization task force, so as that ultimately transitions out into uh, demobilization and recovery, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a, a similar executive, uh, executive command structure over top. So we'll continue to operate the same processes, it will just be a little bit, uh, a somewhat different lens and uh, one that we're actually excited to get underway because all of that, at the point where Dr. Davila and the Toronto Public Health team uh, give us the green light to begin uh, heading in that direction, of course, that means that we will have beaten COVID-19 and uh, that is certainly a day that I can't wait to celebrate. I know Mayor Tory can't wait to celebrate and uh, we all look forward to that day. Mayor Tory, anything you wish to add to that? No, just to say that, uh, you know, inherent in all of that as well as the kind of resumption of normal city services, we've tried very hard uh, under the leadership of the city manager and Chief Pegg and all of us to you know, continue to deliver all of the city services, I think basically without exception. But the city hall remarkably has remained closed during that period for many people, most people. Uh, and so we have to, uh, you know, show some leadership uh, in terms of getting people back to work. Uh, a lot of people want to come back to work and, uh, and we certainly want them to come back to work in the normal manner. And so that again, 
again, as Chief Pegg said, is a complicated matter involving a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of people have been redeployed to other tasks, and we have to figure out how to, you know, and when I say undo that, undo that and get people back to their normal jobs. And so, um, you know, again, as we've done with everything, I mean, Chief Pegg was asked by me and, and Chris Murray to start planning for the operation of city uh, vaccination clinics before there was even a vaccine, because we just knew that this was going to be a big undertaking. He did a great job with a whole team of people, and I think it's one of the reasons why we're doing as well as we are. And so with all of these things, um, you know, one of the things I certainly learned in business, you know, was that you have to start early to plan for things you know are going to happen. And this day is going to come. Uh, heavens above, we want it to come very soon. And we just want to have the best plans in place so that it can be relatively seamless for our employees, but even more so for our clients, who are the people, uh, the residents of the City of Toronto. Uh, perhaps before I ask my second question, can Dr. Davila address that from a medical standpoint and what's expected before that transition takes place? Sure, Dr. Davila, if you could, there you go. Yes, of course, Mark, and, and thanks for the uh, question. Uh, clearly, uh, when we're talking about, uh, you know, recovering and getting to the other side of a pandemic, you're absolutely right. There are medical aspects to this. Certainly, we're going to be watching very carefully on things like vaccination coverage. You've seen the great lengths and efforts that uh, we have gone to at the city and uh, our Team Toronto vaccination partners have gone to as well. Uh, so that clearly those efforts need to continue. We would like to make sure that vaccination coverage is as high as we can possibly get it, recognizing that um, this is important in order to ensure that COVID-19 transmission is kept to um, a minimum to the greatest extent possible. And of course, we're watching the experiences of other jurisdictions and those experiences are telling us that this is uh, priority number one right now. But certainly we uh, recognize that the health of the city is uh, about much more than just COVID-19 and that restoration of, um, you know, some degree of regularity of activities is going to be fundamental to that. So uh, it is very much a changing environment. I think the chief made reference to the fact that we, we, we and as did the mayor, that we wish to be data driven around this and we want to make sure that uh, we are observing uh, that which is happening in the city carefully uh, while we seek to restore all those activities uh, that we have missed so much and that are fundamental to the overall experience of life and health in the city. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, Chief Pegg, if you could also address, you had mentioned uh, some of the activities at clinics that uh, of people getting aggressive. Obviously, you have felt the need to address this publicly. That implies this is a bigger problem than just a couple of cases at a couple of clinics. How big is the problem of people doing these sorts of things and what has been done exactly? Well, Mark, I, I think first and foremost, what I should say is it is still, when you consider that we, we vaccinate, we see nearly 18,000 people a day, uh, every single day across our clinics. So the number of people that, uh, that have represented or have, uh, have arrived and demonstrated inappropriate behaviour is very, very small in consideration of the overall uh, number of folks that we see. Having said that, um, I do feel it's important that A, we are being transparent and that B, um, I'm here asking uh, and frankly receiving, so thank you, uh, receiving the assistance of, of, our, of our extraordinary media in Toronto who can help circulate this message. We, we have seen an increase certainly this week where people are arriving and are becoming, some people are becoming increasingly aggressive, uh, demanding, if you will, a certain, you know, one brand of vaccine or another. We don't have the ability to meet that, um, those, uh, those demands necessarily. This week in clinic operations, and you will recall from some of our earlier discussions, there are, in essence, parallel clinic operations happening. There were an original uh, batch of appointments that were opened in the booking system some time ago, about 60,000 in quantity, and those, those appointments have an allocation of Pfizer vaccine. There were additional, which is great news, the province made, made additional um, quantities and allocations of the Moderna mRNA vaccine available to us, which allowed us to double our clinic capacity and get more people vaccinated. And we had another 60,000 or so people book into those appointments, appointment slots. What we're seeing, unfortunately, and I wouldn't say that this is new, 
but it certainly has it's come to my attention this week our clinic management team has been dealing with it effectively but it just it's where people are looking for and demanding specific you know one particular brand or the other and we may not be able to deliver that Dr. Davila, I'm certainly not a doctor. I don't speak, uh, I don't offer this from my own expertise, but the, the medical professionals like Dr. Davila have been very clear with us that uh, both brands of mRNA vaccine are entirely interchangeable in adults, safely and effectively, and the combination of those two brands represents, uh, two doses represents uh, full immunization status. So that is the basis that our clinic's operating on. And I just, I, I really ask for everyone's patience. I know it's been a long haul. I know people are, are frustrated. Um, I, I understand all of that. I feel those things too. But we have hundreds of people that are working in our clinics every day that are doing their utmost, their very, very best. And what matters to me, what matters to the city and to Mayor Tory is those clinics represent workplaces for us. And that means that every one of our staff are entitled to a safe and respectful workplace. That is a standard we set here at City Hall. It is what we expect in all of our clinics. So I'm asking for everyone's assistance and cooperation. Like I said in my remarks, the clinic staff, whether it be the clinic management staff or the, the, uh, just the, the, clinic, the clinical staff administering the vaccines or all of our support staff, none of those folks control the allocations of vaccine that we receive from the Government of Canada via the province of Ontario. We receive our allocations, that is what we receive. We open appointments uh, to meet that and our commitment is to put every single dose of vaccine that we receive into uh, an eligible arm. And the more people that get their vaccine, uh, the faster we're gonna have COVID-19 behind us. There, are, there have been, there are a, a small percentage of people who uh, will decline, are choosing to decline if they can't get their preferred brand, if you will, and they will leave. That's their right, I respect that. Um, I respect that, but you know I'm also disappointed by it because it's it's very much a missed opportunity uh, for that individual to receive their full vaccination status. So, Mark, thanks for covering this, and to all of our media colleagues, I just anything we can do to help spread the word, and you know just my own personal plea to everyone that is that's going to be engaged in our clinics, understand please that these are people that are tired. They have work, they're working seven days a week, and I believe that they all deserve our courtesy and respect, and I, I'm, I will be most appreciative when that is what they get. Mayor Tory? I'd just like to add one comment, which is on a slightly broader basis. Uh, I understand that people are frustrated, they're tired, uh, but this has happened on a broader basis as well. And as the chief said, it, it's a very narrow group of people who do this. But, you know, the same is true with respect to our Streets to Homes team as who, who have been followed home and threatened and, and abused when they're just trying to do their job helping to take people who are experiencing homelessness and uh, get them a, a different place to live. We've seen it on the beaches and in the parks when people are, again, just doing their job, sometimes doing something as simple as to remind people that there are you know limits and rules with respect to alcohol in those places or other things like that use of fireworks um, and they're treated with uh, you know complete uh, contempt and disrespect and it's a very small group of people who do this but I hope people understand these are just public servants that are doing their job they're doing the job in the broader public interest based on rules that have been duly passed and you know frankly I guess as is often the case if you want to blame somebody blame an elected official for putting those rooms in place uh, the rules in place but public servants should not be mistreated any more so than they can be blamed for whatever vaccine happens to be available based on global supply or other things like that. And I just hope people will understand that because these are hardworking people uh, trying to do their job and working, uh, you know, day and night to make sure we get through this pandemic and get uh, out to the other side. All right. Thank you. We'll go next to David Ryder from the Toronto Star. Dave, go ahead, please. Hi, everybody. I think my first question is for Dr. Davila and, and Mayor Tory, if he wants to, to add anything. And that's, uh, um, I believe there's some data out for the Scotiabank Clinic talking about where the people who are vaccinated live, and that it's a lot of downtown residents and not so much the parts of the city that are still northwest, especially, that are um, especially unvaccinated and where you need to do those efforts for first and second dose. Can you address that and, and any other insights on uh, the demographics of our vaccination effort right now? Dr. Davila? Sure. Thanks, David. So I haven't had the opportunity to see those data. I'd be very happy to look at them. But I will say this, David, I think we need to ensure that our entire city has access to vaccine. Um, as you've just heard uh, my colleagues there say, 
Uh, and as you'll hear public health uh, officials the world over um, speak, you'll hear them say that absolutely vaccination is our way to the other side of this pandemic. And that means absolutely for all of us. Uh, and in the city of Toronto, that includes those who live downtown, as well as those who live in the other uh, parts of the city, uh, you know, north, east, west. Uh, we certainly need to cover all those uh, different neighborhoods. Uh, I would say that the um, uh, Scotiabank Clinic was clearly conveniently located for those who are more central in the city, but we continue to have many, many efforts, mobile clinics, pop-ups, through all the vaccination partners, and yes, through Toronto Public Health and City of Toronto mobile clinic efforts to ensure that access is provided to the greatest extent possible to other parts of the city as well, in order that, uh, you know, we wanna make sure that everybody, regardless of where you live in the city, has an opportunity to get uh, appropriate vaccination coverage and, and, and get that protective benefit uh, from COVID-19 vaccines so we can get to the other side of this pandemic. Mayor Tory. Uh, David, uh, it was brought to my attention, certainly in the kind of proposal to put on the Scotiabank Arena uh, clinic, the mass clinic of that kind, that uh, one of the targets was to, within walking distance of the huge numbers of people who fortunately live in the downtown of our city, who represent a certain demographic, and there were their levels of under uh, vaccination relative to the overall average uh, in the city. And so that was a, an objective, actually, was to try and get some of those people to come, which they did. Uh, and I haven't yet seen the details of the numbers, but I was even told during the day that the people who'd booked appointments were people who responded from that geographic area. We've been intensively involved in discussions at all uh, different levels of the organization with respect to what we can be doing uh, in the northwest west end of the city, for example. And all I will say is thus far our discussions have indicated that the people on the ground there in the neighborhoods who know best what is going to cause people there uh, to get out have, have indicated to us they think a, a big event of any kind at some other location in the northwest end is not what is called for but rather that maybe what we'll do is have a day or a weekend coming up quite soon where there's a whole lot of smaller events that take place in a, in a big concerted way but it's a smaller series of events almost neighborhood by neighborhood place by place and that's the more likely direction in which we're headed. So I think people should just understand that this is a, uh, a work in progress, this entire strategy, and whereas the Scotiabank Arena was an applicable and appropriate thing to do for the downtown and, and other parts of the city, that there will be a different plan put in place, but there will definitely be one and is one, in addition to the ongoing efforts that are happening today, uh, probably a week or so from now, that will uh, put a concentrated push on to move up the levels of vaccination in that area, but it will probably be done in a different way based on the advice that we're being given as to what will work. You just muted yourself, Dave. There you go. I apologize. Uh, for the, um, this was for Chief, uh, for Mayor Tory on Active TO. And that's um, originally in the spring when the city staff recommended not involving Lakeshore West at all. It was citing in, uh, traffic impacts and mostly sort of potential traffic impacts based on other closures nearby. Um, now we're hearing there's data uh, suggesting that traffic impacts but uh, reporting by my colleague Ben Spur uh, quoted saying Mark Grimes uh, was very adamant to city staff that it, in his ward it, it caused problems and it should not go ahead. Um, you know, Councillor Grimes has never been known as a champion of, of cycling or bike lanes at City Hall. So I'm just wondering how much of the influence is from the local councillor who is relaying what he perceives his residents want and how much is actually based on either construction happening nearby or the data that you talked about earlier? Well, I think the fair answer, David, is all of the above. I mean, I have a responsibility in ultimately looking at the recommendations that are made by city staff to take into account all of these different considerations which affect some people very locally and other people across the city. What I don't uh, find to be a reasonable kind of approach is those who just say well, we should take an absolute position just saying everything will be open regardless of the consequences for anybody else other than those who might want to cycle or those who have a, a view on that, uh, or that we should bow entirely to the wishes of uh, local residents. We have to take all of those things into account. And so when when you see, first of all, on the one hand, the incredible use that it gets, the Lakeshore West option in particular, that makes you want to make it available as often as possible, but that has to be balanced against the fact that uh, it also triples 
the traffic time, and it's not because it triples the traffic time in and of itself, it is because that in turn causes people then to make decisions to go into the local neighborhoods and cause a very disruptive uh, circumstance for thousands of people who live in those neighborhoods. So my job, as with everything, is to sort of balance those interests and what we've done I think achieves that, which is to say we're going to have it on some weekends as opposed to others. We're going to open up new places to have active TO, so we're not backing away from the principle this is a good program and we should, we should have it. Um, and we've taken everybody's issues into account. But of course, we listen to the local councillor, we listen to the local residents directly who email uh, my office and, and, and register their views with me. We listen to the views of the cycling and pedestrian community who want to have these opportunities available to them, and we've tried to take the program across the city. And so I'm actually very happy and very content that what we've come up with here for July is a balanced program. We'll assess it again during the month and look at the data and then uh, decide what we'll do for August. But uh, you know, I can't necessarily be beholden to or absolutely listening rigidly to any part of the community because it's not in the nature of my job, and I don't. Uh, I take everybody's views into account, as does the city management, and that's what we've uh, come up with for July. All right, thank you. Final question is to uh, Sneha Agrawal from CBC News. Go ahead, Sneha. Thank you. I know Chief Peg addressed fireworks and the rules around them, but we have seen large parties on city beaches during past long weekends. A number of them have resulted in piles of litter and fireworks being an issue. What measures will be in place to manage or curb any of these issues? Hi, good morning. Uh, our coordinated enforcement team uh, is fully connected and uh, of course have been throughout the throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and are certainly uh, certainly so. Uh, the plans are in place. Those, uh, those coordinated enforcement folks will be active and uh, out and about, if you will, not only on Canada Day, but of course throughout the weekend. That will include uh, frequent and regular uh, safety checks and patrols of, of uh, areas that include beaches. Um, there, and that, it, that also involves uh, the various marine units, so both land-based and, and water-based. Um, we have always, throughout the response to COVID-19, taken a coordinated approach and really done our best and we will continue to do our best. I'm confident that, that every one of our enforcement people will continue to do their best to find that appropriate balance, but uh, there are times when enforcement is necessary and uh, the combination of, uh, of course, municipal licensing and standards, Toronto Police um, and our Toronto Public Health folks will all be uh, on duty, will all be engaged and are, are fully prepared to respond to issues uh, as as they occur and of course uh, remain proactive. Uh, Brad, I'm not sure if Carlton wishes to add. I don't think meritorious. Add, sorry, sorry. I just want to make one thing clear to people that sometimes they might forget because it is confusing sometimes as to what rules are in place where. The use of fireworks on beaches and in public parks is illegal at all times. And I think most people will understand why that is, because they, they generally speaking, have large crowds of people, and it just isn't safe uh, to be setting off fireworks. There are limited exceptions made for fireworks to be set off on private property on Canada Day and on Victoria Day, and that should be done with great discretion and great consideration for safety. But it is illegal at all times, in any circumstance, no matter what day it is, to have fireworks on beaches and parks, and that is why we need to have enforcement people, especially when we've seen people that, even beyond the law, defy common sense and any kind of you know, credulity when they actually set off fireworks and aim them at each other. This is just not civilized behavior, and so we have to keep an eye on that. If someone were killed or injured uh, in that uh, course, I mean, people would, would, would ask a lot of questions, needless to say, and we just want to not have that happen, and it mostly involves people just cooperating with the law as it has stood for a long time. Beaches and public parks, no fireworks anytime because they're public places and private property in very limited and hopefully very safe uh, circumstances. Yeah. Follow-up, Sneha? Um, yeah, my follow-up is the Pacific National Exhibition announced today that it will open this year. Did the City of Toronto pull the plug too early on cancelling the Canadian National Exhibition? PNE is on, Stampede is on, but CNE is cancelled. Well, I will just say this. Uh, everybody has to make their own decisions. And in our case, uh, these decisions to have a lot of these events into the later summer uh, cancelled were made in, in discussion with 
different organizations involved, and it really related not to any uh, prediction that couldn't be, couldn't be made about what the health circumstances would be at that time, but rather because of that precise uncertainty. In order to put on these large events, the organizations in question, which are largely non-profit organizations, in other words, they don't have a huge, uh, you know, kind of surplus sitting in a bank account somewhere to finance all kinds of contracts and, and, and people being hired that they then have to, uh, to cancel and pay for, uh, these organizations just couldn't afford to make the commitments necessary to hire up a whole lot of people and sign a whole lot of contracts with the certainty that the health situation would be as it needed to be to have a big crowd scene like that. And I think we could even sit here today and say that while things are much better and while we're making huge progress on vaccinations and while case counts are down, none of us know what's going to be going on at the end of August. We hope it's going to be great. We hope it's going to be great. There are signs that it's going to be good. But uh, the notion that we could say with certainty that the CNE or any other organization should go ahead and sign millions and millions of dollars of contract and hire up all kinds of people um, is just not something that, that we can say. And as a result, they can't take the risk uh, to their own organization of, of doing just that, signing up contracts that they then have to cancel and pay huge fines and, and penalties on, or hiring up people that then would have to be dehired and perhaps uh, have some damages to be paid. Uh, beyond that, I will just say that even as this moment, at this moment, we do not have, and I strongly encourage the provincial government to come forward next week because we need to have it, the guidelines that are necessary even for small theatre companies and small music venues and how many people can be in those, let alone a scene where there's going to be tens of thousands of people in a day, albeit outside. And so we need to have guidelines for all these things, which we don't have at the moment. They're working on them. Uh, and I think that's going to be vitally important to reopening music venues and theatres, let alone a huge thing like the CNE. So it was a decision that was made at a time when it had to be made in terms of all these contracts. At the time, I believe it was the right decision that was made. And what is happening elsewhere is the decisions that they're making. Um, and uh, who knows uh, you know, who's, who's right or wrong about these things. The, the point isn't to say that somebody's right or else somebody else is wrong. You have to do what you believe to be right at the time you make the decision, and that's what we've tried to do. All right, thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. That concludes today's briefing. Please have a safe and pleasant long weekend.